Welcome to what appears to be uh, Asia Link and University of Melbourne's last webinar seminar for the year 2022. Um, it's been a very eventful year, of course, both for Australia and Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia having just um, concluded its uh, consequential 15th general elections. Before we begin today's proceeding, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are all present today here in Australia. Uh, and I'm on the lands of uh, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation we, and pay our respects uh, to the elders past, present and emerging. We extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people who may be attending the online event today on land that was never ceded. This webinar um, will be recorded so if you have any questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A function on the Zoom box right at the bottom. And we will endeavor to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the session, uh, at the end of um, some of the presentations made by our three distinguished panelists today. Um, to begin with, uh, we welcome the new federal MP from Penang, from Bukit Bandera, uh, historic, uh, quite famous Penang seat, uh, Shalina Abdul Rashid, who is uh, just finished um, the first session of the new parliament. And she's still in KL, but I believe she's about to rush back to Penang as soon as this is done. Uh, we also welcome Shaza Shukri, who is a assistant professor at the International Islamic University, who focuses and specializes on themes of political Islam and also the political systems um, of the region that include Malaysia. Welcome, Shaza. And last but not least, Professor James Chin, uh, Professor of Asian Studies at University of Tasmania and one of, I guess, um, the world's most well-known Malaysianists uh, who has been very active uh, commenting and analyzing the outcomes of what is also a historic uh, hung parliament and the subsequent uh, unity government that now run by, uh, led by Anwar Ibrahim in Malaysia. Welcome, James. I think to start with, we could talk about uh, what has happened um, since the historic elections of the 15th general elections of 19th of November. Uh, we, some of us have read, of course, the ins and outs and the daily dramas and traumas and um, perhaps even mini scandals of how this unity government has come about and how Anwar Ibrahim has become Malaysia's 10th prime minister. After nearly 30 years of striving really to claim this prize ever since uh, he became the deputy leader of UMNO in the boom years of the 1990s, deputy to Dr. Mahathir Mohamed, who then of course subsequently sacked and jailed him and perhaps um, provoked and started this other uh, saga of the reformasi movement, which you could say culminated in the 2018, um, 14th general elections. But since then, we've had, of course, um, an unprecedented pandemic, uh, a major crisis in Malaysia's economy, like in the rest of the region, and all the political turmoil that's come with that, including, again, the unprecedented three prime ministers, three governments in three years. So. What we have now is we're in week two and a bit of a new unity government led by Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim. Even saying that feels a bit odd after 20 plus years, half of which he spent in jail. And now he's finally made it. And uh, on the government benches in parliament is Shalina Abdul Rashid, uh, our new member of parliament. Um, but of course, Shalina, you're quite experienced anyway in the Penang state government as a former state government minister. Um, but this is your federal debut. And I was just curious to ask uh, if you could perhaps start this off by uh, explaining to us 
what this means, this 10th uh, prime minister uh, who's come to power in many ways in a very unusual circumstance. Well, thank you very much um, for, 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 for this. I guess I'll, I'll start off uh, straight away by saying that, you know, the events that has happened in the past um, month or so has been very surreal, especially for Malaysians, because, um, you know, the victory that we felt this time around is very much different than what we felt in 2018. Um, 2018, we saw Pakatan Harapan, you know, government, and then with, you know, like what you said earlier, the, the, the hung parliament that happened, you know, it wasn't something that wasn't expected it, for many, for quite some time there, there had always been discussions about the possibilities of it, having this hung parliament, which happened and which thrust the country into a different, um, different sphere, uh, sphere. Um, so in other words, now we're facing a, a reality in that, you know, the unity government, it's real, um, you know, it's, it's a, un, uh, it's a Pakatan led unity government and when it, in it, there are a lot of challenges because you have to create policies that, that, um, that, that can also help, uh, people of, you know, the people of other, other factions especially rivals or parliamentary uh, rivals and so forth. But coming back to, to the situation right now, um, there are, you know, I think, I think it opens Malaysia into a, a more mature system. Um, you know, we, we've had discussions where the old days of, you know, one dominant uh, political party dominating um, the, the, the administration, I think that itself is becoming more of a thing of the past, but then again, we'll, we'll talk about the possibilities. Um, but also one, one more thing that's apparent um, based on you know what's going on is that number one, the situation that we we see right now, um, you know, we're still coming up from the the, the pandemic, the econ economic recession. It's something that's very much real. So right now, the focus is on repairing this country. How can we formulate? policies that can benefit everyone. That's one thing. And also, how can we repair the damages that we've seen? I mean, first of all, you know, you see the results of um, GE15. You know, there's this whole whole um, reference to the green wave. You know, there is a rising conservatism that needs to be addressed. And, you know, you just recently you've had Rather, you've had um, people from the opposition um, MPs, especially Machang, who, who I think recently went on um, a BFM uh, interview and pretty much defended, you know, his party's uh, stance and started to demonize words like secularism and so forth. I mean, extremism is something very much real, and you know, in the past few decades, we've seen a rise in that. So right now, we need to find a way to address this properly. And um, seeing how, you know, when you're when you're dealing with an opposition that is very much set in using race and religion to counter or rather to suppress um, discourse. This is something where I feel the, uh, you know, Karaja and Prapaduan or even our, us in Pakistan Harapa, we need to really focus on what works best for the people and just really drown out all of the negative extremist bigots to focus on what kind of policies can actually be implemented to help um, the, the country repair and come up from, you know, pandemic. Uh, sorry, I was um, muted. Um, I suppose we could go further into this to uh, talk a bit more also about what measures are actually achievable or feasible for this new government, which seems to have been, I guess, for lots of people, precariously put together with uh, the former nemesis of Anwar, which is Amno, um, led by Zayed Hamidi, who himself is facing 40 over charges 
uh, for alleged corruption and so on, and how long he can stay as Deputy Prime Minister, and forging it with um, a so-called Borneo block of uh, significant MP, minority of MPs. Um, in all of this um, precarious political landscape of a patchwork of uh, political rivals into a governing coalition, I was wondering whether we could hear um, how you see it, uh, Professor James Chin, um, in terms of, you know, Anwar finally getting to the PM's job, but um, how long can he hold on to do this and do something worthwhile? Uh, thank you very much, Ken. Uh, thank you to the uh, University of Melbourne for the kind invitation uh, to attend this seminar. So my take on the election is, I think it's very important to understand uh, there are several important things that happened in this election. Uh, the first is something that's alerted to by the previous speaker, which is the green wave. I think whether you like it or not, uh, past performance is really quite remarkable from 18 seats to 43 seats. So I think she has raised some uh, really, really important question whether this means a permanent realignment of rural Malay votes, that's number one. But there are several other issues which I think is really, really important that, is, uh, that we should discuss or Malaysia should discuss. Uh, secondly, is I think this is the first election where clearly, clearly because the political class could not come together or could not uh, form a coalition together, that the royal institutions was dragging the Malay rulers and they were forced uh, more or less uh, to pick a side and to ask somebody to form a government. Uh, this, has, as far as I know, has not happened in such a manner before in Malaysian politics. I think another important point is something that you alerted to, Kim, which is the rise of East Malaysia, Sabah and Sarawak. Now, what is really interesting about Sabah and Sarawak now is that if you look at cabinet appointments, it's really heavily loaded with people from Sabah and Sarawak. If you look at GPS alone, which is the ruling coalition in Sarawak, they've got five full, fem full ministers and uh, several more deputy ministers, plus the Sabah contingent. And what is remarkable about that was that, of course, GPS initially started off supporting Perikatan National to form the government. But because of the royal intervention, they decided to go with uh, Anwar Ibrahim. Uh, but it's really, really important to understand that the dynamics have shifted. Uh, because for the very first time also, you have somebody from East Malaysia being appointed the Deputy Prime Minister. I think it's also very important that uh, we talk about these three visions from Malaysia, something that the previous speaker alerted to. So I think what has happened to Malaysia after this election is that uh, although it's a unity government, uh, the big problem we have now is something that we haven't resolved for many, many years. And that is the narrative of what is Malaysia. Uh, to me, at least, it seems that we have basically three different Malaysias now. We have a Malaysia that's been promoted by past Perikatan National, which is essentially what we call the Green Wave Malaysia. And then we have the Malaysia that's promoted by the people in the urban areas, for lack of a better word, uh, Pakatan Harapan supporters. And then we have a vision of Malaysia, which is coming out of East Malaysia. So the question is that how do you carve a policy that will meet the needs of not only all these three different groups, but sort of come together into a single vision for Malaysia. Now, I'm not saying that it's, it's not doable. I'm just saying that this is a long-standing issue in Malaysia. And that it is something that Anwar Ibrahim will have to deal with. Because if you look at his earlier writing, his early political career, he did alert to this issue very, very early on. Uh, in fact, from the very first time, he, his famous book, The Asian Renaissance, he spoke about this. So I think uh, we really have to uh, worry about this because increasingly, whether we like it or not, identity politics is taking a hold on the uh, Malaysian population. So I think these are some of the issues we, we have to deal with. But I think the easiest issue is actually the East Malaysian issue that you asked me about, Kim, because I think essentially what the East Malaysians want are basically more autonomy. Uh, they want the federal government to recognize the special status of Sabah and Sarawak and they want the so-called historical grievances and SEC3 issue resolved. Uh, those things actually can be resolved uh, quite easily because it's a political issue. But the issue of a vision for a common Malaysia, I think that's much harder to resolve because uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are three very distinct visions for Malaysia and each of these political class are big enough for them to ignore the other two visions. 
And I think that is a really, really key issue. So I think we can't run away from that topic. And I really think that uh, Malaysians should really look at themselves, ask themselves, uh, what is Malaysia to them and what is Malaysia for the future? Thanks, James. That was a very good um, overview for us to grapple with as we go along. I'd like to bring in um, Dr. Shaza Shukri now um, to perhaps make some comments or uh, share some of her views and expertise on this because um, uh, as recently as what overnight, uh, we've had uh, someone who is effectively now the leader of the biggest group of opposition MPs, who's also the spiritual leader of PAS, the Islamist party, uh, Hadi Awang, making a statement, a very long statement online, which effectively frames all those who support what he calls secular parties like the DAP and the current government um, as being murtads, you know, or um, people who are outside the faith and uh, perhaps alleging and framing it as a religious quest really to um, vanquish political opponents. I mean, it becomes very difficult, I suppose. How do you uh, make that correspond, I suppose, with the type of parliamentary democracy that we understand it, Shaza? And I mean, I know you've written some fascinating articles recently about the type of uh, political Islam that is at work in Malaysia. And you've also noted um, differences between the understanding of this so-called green wave that is apparent uh, in the 15th general elections. Dr. Shaza? Right, thank you so much, Kim, for that nice um, introduction and segue to what I'm about to speak on. And I also have to say thanks to Professor James and Shalina because they've also alluded to the Green Wave earlier, right? So we can tell that it's, it's something that we are all paying attention to and we can't ignore it. So if you go back to this issue on the Green Wave, see, that's the thing. Um, I realized that there are two sides to it, right? I mean, analysis on it. There are some who are who, who sees it as a green wave, and then there are those who disagree with it. Um, I'll just bring in a, a, a personal conversation I had with a well-known um, human rights activist and political scientist in Malaysia. And um, he told me that he did not agree that it's a green wave. Um, he laughed at the notion because um, to him, this is not about Muslims in Malaysia becoming more Islamic, but it is really a, a protest vote against uh, Barisan National. Um, in a way, we can understand uh, where he's coming from, where that idea come from. <sighs> but the thing is, okay, I'll just bring in some numbers first, uh, if I may. In a way, it's true because if we look at support for PAS in terms of voter percentage, it actually uh, dipped by 2%. We're talking about percentage here. Um, but vote percentage for Bersatu, which is, of course, a component party of Prikata National, uh, increased from 5% to about, let me see, 13%. So that's a huge jump there uh, in terms of vote for Bersatu. So in a way, perhaps it is true because the Satu is more of a Malay nationalist party as opposed to past uh, version of, of uh, political Islam in Malaysia. But, but I know it's a simplification, right? Um, because the Satu being part of Perikatan National, so a vote for the Satu is, is technically a vote for uh, PN and in a way PAS as well. Um, so this is where I, I go to the other side of the argument. And for me, I do see a green something, right? If we don't want to call it a wave, maybe a wave seems a bit too big, right? No one's talking about a tsunami. A ripple, maybe, but even a ripple is the huge ripple. Um, for me, we can't deny that, okay, Pakatan Harapan did win the largest um, number and uh, percentage of votes and seats, right? So some people have pointed to that as saying, nah, this is not a green wave. If it's a green wave, then Pakatan Harapan uh, would lost more, but they came out on top in terms of the biggest number, correct? But 
we can't deny looking at especially in the northern uh, states in Malaysia past specifically has made inroads in um, constituencies that used to be Harapan stronghold right um, like William uh, Matang Pao where Anna Ibrahim's daughter lost um, the by-election in Padang Serai so my point is that if this is the protest vote against Barista National we understand Barista National losing seats to Perikatan National candidates. So how do you explain um, Pakatan Harapan losing seats uh, to Perikatan National? Again, we can imagine the, the, the conversation, the argument going that, look, um, in 2018, when Pakatan Harapan won most seats, the majority of seats across Malaysia, is because the Malays, again, similarly, voted for them as a protest against Pakistan National and specifically against Najib Razak and 1MDB. Um, but the, the seats that I mentioned have been uh, Pakaran Harapan seat even before 2018. So what I'm trying to say here is that on top of the push factor uh, of Pakistan National, you can't deny there is a pull factor here that they are choosing Perikatan National uh, over others. Another example, if I may, um, if it's just a protest against Pakistan National, they could have easily voted for Mahathir's Pejuang if they wanted. But as we know, Pejuang lost all the seats that they contested in. So again, my point here is that there is something about PAS and Perikatan uh, that attracted people. So here is where we go into this, this conversation about what is it about PAS and NPN. Um, so for me, of course, I, I, don't, I don't put the blame, or how should I put this? It's not squarely a, a religious issue, right? It, it's not a fault of Islam or, or even political Islam. Um, we know, if we look at Malaysia's history, we've, we've, we've experienced this rise in Islamization in, in the bureaucracy, in society for the past 40 years. Right? We, we've seen it, we've experienced it, we've felt it. Um, but this Islamization for me is shallow. So that's why I say it's not, it's not Islam's fault, right? Uh, the Islamization that we've seen is based on just good practice of the religion and to an extreme, uh, to this emphasis on implementation of so-called Sharia law, but they're not talking about the spirit of Islam, about you know things like Makassid or Sharia, the objective of the law itself. Um, so when PAS, uh, as a party that speaks on this level of Islamization, this shallow level of Islamization that I mentioned, um, easily uh, they can garner people's attention and, and more than that, people's vote, right? Um, so the question now that we want to ask is, why 2022? Yeah, it's been 40 years in the making, we understand that. But this wave happened now. Um, one of the, uh, I guess, explanations that I've seen thrown is that, oh, this is the youth's fault, right? Because for the first time, 18-year-olds and above can vote. Um, and at the same time, we see this wave. So there must be something going on here. But for me, that's a, that's a fallacy, actually. Perhaps there's a correlation, but I, I don't see a causation because the youth vote, I think, is not enough to actually cause this swing. And anecdotally, if I may, um, from friends and associates who were uh, counting agents on the night of election, they've informed me that um, the, the youth vote are actually split. Um, between PH and PN, it is actually the millennials, the 30s and 40 year olds, um, they are the ones who voted um, strongly for Perikatan National. So here we go to another question in trying to understand the, the, the psyche um, of these millennials, these 30 and 40 year olds. Why? Why they swing um, towards Perikatan National? Of course, we, we can think of many, many reasons, right? Besides the youth factor, uh, of course, um, a lot of people have 
put it on um, social media, on TikTok, etc. But for me, I want to focus on two things. Um, first is the fact that we know that this people in this age group are typically more conservative. I mean, across the globe, right? Not just in Malaysia, they're more conservative because they're focusing more on, on, on their family, on their career. If we look at Malaysia, uh, due to the pressure of the Islamization of society that I mentioned earlier, or sometimes I've, I've used the term pop Islam as well, meaning popular Islam, um, they, this group of people previously were not so much interested in religion in their youth, um, but now at this point in their life, they've become more invested. Um, and to some even, they are starting to learn about the religion, um, but they're learning basic Islam, sometimes even with their kids. For me, this is not a problem, right? As, as a Muslim, of course, I'm not against anyone wanting to learn about the religion at any point in their life. But my point is that to make up for the lost years, um, they are looking for some quick fixes. You know, in, including in, in, in politics. So when PASS comes in and, and tell them that vote for us, we are the supposed relig a party of religion. If you vote for us, you're on the right path. And like you mentioned, Kim, beyond that, um, telling people if you don't vote for PASS, then going to hell to that extreme. And people who don't understand truly the spirit of Islam, then they are easily swayed um, by that. Uh, so that's my first working hypothesis, which I want to look into more. But my second point, and I think this one is covered more widely by, by many, uh, many others before this and, and in one of my own research as well, which is that the Malay Muslims in Malaysia, their actual main concern is actually on their economic standing. Um, they've seen their... Uh, situation improved uh, from generations prior, but they can't help looking at relative wealth, right? And, and data has shown uh, that, of course, on average, uh, Chinese community uh, makes more than the Malay community, that's on average. So unfortunately, again, the Chinese became a boogeyman. And this is what us uh, continue to, to speak on, to hold on to. And then we have the pandemic which worsened uh, situation, economic situation for the Malays. And then this is when we saw Mohidin Yassin came in as prime minister for 17 months. And he introduced things like allowing people to uh, take out their own retirement saving, etc. cetera. Um, so he appears as the savior. So again, when we talk about the economy, you know, PH's brand of structural reform in the economy is a bit hard for them to understand. Um, but when they compare that to what PAS is offering something in the immediate term, um, that is where again, uh, they can easily support us. So I'll just stop here first. Thanks, Shaza. That was uh, very insightful for us. I, I think um, what I we could go to is firstly, perhaps with Shalina and then maybe with James, but Shalina, given your experience um, in the Penang state government, which has been possibly the most successful in the Federation. And even over the economic trauma of the pandemic uh, era and the lockdowns and the mass rise in joblessness and underemployment and so on and uh, rising inequality and poverty levels. Some of this, of course, feeds very well, right, into your opposition's um, timelines and narratives, right? I mean, they they talk about this uh, inequality and attempt then to translate it and frame it as what a challenge to themes like uh, Kotoran Malayu, Malay supremacy being endangered. And of course, your party itself is very much under direct attack from that. How, how do you think this new Anwar Ibrahim government of which you're part of uh, can actually address and help fix that. Right, so um, just the example of say being being the uh, Penang state government, you know, we've been, the Pakistan has been in the administration for 
15 years. And throughout my first term as Adun, um, you know, I, I do say that I can say that, you know, we've we've treated the opposition fairly, and especially during the, the pandemic, the two years of lockdowns and so forth, we we actually worked with them to help, you know, people of Penang. You know, there were so many uh, individuals and families affected. So I guess the situation in Penang is it's a bit different, but then being thrust in the federal uh, landscape, it's it's a different league altogether. And um, you know, seeing the dangers of extremism, and I do say it's extremism. That's the type of um, narrative that the opposition is pushing for. Um, first and foremost, I just I do want to add a few things on what James mentioned, and I do agree that in Malaysia we do have three types of Malaysians. And um, you know we can't deny that there is not a clear or even solid Malaysian identity, and I do believe that this is a result of years of of the division that we felt. You know, you're you're always segregated. You're always being labeled as this and that and so forth. Lain lain dan sebagainya. So that itself has kept Malaysians rather confused. So when you have that confusion and that lost sense of identity, and then you also, you know, you, you use fear as a way to keep people suppressed, repressed, and oppressed, I guess. You know, which also highlights the fact that uh, as what um, was mentioned earlier about the, the ripple, the green ripple, uh, as you know, I, I do agree, it's not exactly a wave, but it is a considerable amount of movement that we need to pay attention to. Now, when you talk, when you when you factor in fear and insecurities, and that's where the far right of the political spectrum tends to to be at the most, I guess, powerful in a sense. Now, one thing that a lot of people did realize was all of a sudden after post GE 15, people start talking about the TikTok contents of you know, for example, the, the, the May 13th boogeyman. There were also content videos stating that they vote for Pakatan. If you don't vote for, you know, Prikatan, then you will go to hell. So it all boils down to the fact that right now, the focus should be on increasing political education. Um, you can say that you know, you know, the considerable amount of youth voted and also, um, you know, the millennials did vote for Prikata and yeah, and right now we should focus on fact finding and figure out, figuring things out in a way that we can better structure from the next five years. TikTok, um, I'll just give you an example. Like um, the algorithms that exist for TikTok is, it's weird. Even, even I myself, I can't, I can't um, explain, but what it does is that it keeps people in a constant um, like echo chamber. So for example, mine, it's just filled with cat videos because that's all I watch on TikTok, right? But then when you have other people, they watch different contents and that's that little loop. So what it does is that it keeps people in a loop of misinformation. And the only way for us to combat that is through education. And this is where, again, political education needs to be reformed. We need to find a way to teach our young, even, even the adults on how to digest information. Because right now we live in an age where information is so easy. You know, it's, it's literally in click of a button and you swipe up and down and you get such information. So the next five years should be focused on education, media literacy, and um, just find a way to work with um, other agencies to make sure that dangerous content such as that, you know, would be would be um, restricted. Thanks, Shalina. I, I was wondering whether, um, James, you might have some views on that. In many ways, it comments about your earlier um, explanation or plea, I suppose, for us as Malaysians to consider what type of nation we want? So I think uh, just to add on to uh, the previous speaker, I think it's really important that uh, Malaysians should have a bare minimum, sort of a bare agreement uh, what Malaysia should be. Uh, the last time we did it was during uh, Ruku Tadanga, which is the, the 
five uh, core beliefs of what Malaysia should be like. And after that, there was another attempt, and that attempt was basically uh, Martin's uh, Wawasan Dua Pulau Dua Pulau plus his idea of Bansa Malaysia. Uh, but they all fell apart because uh, my understanding is that the Malay ground pushed back very, very strongly. So I think what we really need uh, at the bare minimum, I think we can't do it now. Uh, sorry, just to digress a little bit. My take is that the Anwar Ibrahim government now, the first priority besides what Serena has mentioned, which is economic recovery, is that they have to claw back uh, in the next year's state election because everyone is using that as the baseline argument about whether there is such a thing as a green wave or green ripple, whatever you call it. So they have to concentrate on winning, at least in, in my point of view, they must win four out of the six contests. Uh, and if they lose, uh, you know, if they just win one or two, I think they'll be in, in big political trouble. Uh, okay, setting that aside, I think what they really need to do is that they really need to hold some sort of, a, if for lack of a battle, a people's congress, where all the groups come in together and have a discussion, what sort of Malaysia do you want? And if there is such a thing as Malaysia, what is the minimum, you know, that we all agree on? Because I think, you know, among the so-called chartering class, even among the so-called extreme right, uh, they do recognize that, you know, if everything falls apart, everybody lose. Right now, the problem is that they're speaking in their own little bubbles. I'm one of the very few people who, how should I say it, uh, join some really weird WhatsApp group <laughs> who post also some crazy stuff there, right? Normally, a Chinese person will never join these groups. But I've been reading a lot of stuff that, you know, you'll be very, very surprised. And, and, you know, I, and I'm in some so-called non-Malay Bansa crowd groups. Uh, you know, the contents are so different. It's really you are living in two separate uh, bubbles. You really need some sort of assembly where you bring everybody together and say, what is the minimum? What is the vision for Malaysia? Now, this thing has been done in many countries around the world. It is not something unique, right? You've got all these assemblies held in many other countries around the world. But I think what is good for Malaysia, and there has a lot of positive about Malaysia, is that we are at a developmental stage where it is still possible to hold uh, civilized conversations. Now, of course, I'm sure if this thing goes ahead, the politicians will say, you've got to hold it, close doors. And that I don't, dis I, I don't agree with. My point is that everybody should be given a chance to express what you want. And very often when everyone is represented, some commonality would emerge. And I would really like to see this thing about a Malaysian identity, because as long as this issue is not resolved, uh, we're never gonna resolve this issue about, you know, I know it's, it's, it's like the old, old very question that was asked straight after 1970, what role does Islam play in the, in, you know, in, in the public space? Until today, right, this issue has not been resolved. And this is part of the larger identity thing. What does it mean to be a Malaysian? And I can tell you, right, this thing has been done in another country very close to us in Singapore. They did it very early after Independence 65, and they managed to come up with what it means to be Singapore. As it means to be a Singaporean. And I'm not saying they're wholly successful, but it's quite clear that in terms of Singapore identity, they're much more successful than us. And you know, essentially, they're also a three-race society. But of course, the demographic is, is slightly different. The, the Chinese are a majority over there. But I'm saying that the core issues are still the same. They were grappling this idea of a Singapore identity. Uh, nothing is perfect in Singapore. Of course, you can argue that it's a small island state. But I'm saying that they have gone through the process and they did come up with something. And I could never understand why the Malaysian government could not do something similar. I would have thought somebody, a leader of Mate statue would have understood this. And you know, and instead he came up with this idea of Bansa Malaysia, but it, it was done without much consultation. And he came up with Wasan 2020, which was basically driven by uh, you know, his so-called uh, Japanese consultants or that sort of thing. But my point is that I think it is time for us uh, coming up to the 60th anniversary of the Federation to come up and have a proper discussion about what it means to Malaysia. Because I can tell you, there's a lot of frustration, especially among the so-called marginalized groups in the rural Malay areas and in Sabah and so on. They all want their voices heard. Right now, they're just speaking in their own echo chambers. And it's made worse by social media. Because uh, on top of what the previous speaker has said, the problem with social media is not only on top of Telegram, is that the people who want to look for such news, right? They gear themselves up to look for these echo chambers as well. So it's sort of a double whammy. Not only is the system pushing you to listen or watch certain type of things, 
you yourself are reinforced and go and look for these groups. So it, it, is, it is one of those issues which I think that if we don't do anything, uh, you know, if we don't, if we're not careful about going forward about dealing with this issue, if we don't have this idea of a common identity, then, you know, we will be coming back in five years time, you know, arguing about, about these sort of issues again. Thanks, James. That was very useful. I guess what we're really looking at now is the immediate problem of uh, the new prime minister and his government having to tackle pretty difficult economic circumstances, not to mention uh, a lot of uh, problems that will arise from the big flooding events happening right now across the peninsula. And then the uh, medium term or the next 12 you know, 24 months problem of uh, having to win critical state elections, as you point out, uh, in the face of current opposition, and having an Anwar Ibrahim government in, with enough credibility to host some sort of uh, Malaysia future Congress, a Congress about what Malaysia should be, um, that would require some political capital, which I wonder whether he will have enough of to used to burn. Um, I was thinking that maybe we could try and tackle some of the questions that have now arisen uh, in the Q&A. I welcome all of you who are watching who would want to participate in this to just, you know, tap, type in some uh, questions for us in the Q&A. To go off um, these questions first, uh, they are addressed to Shalina, to Shaza, and also to James in no particular order. I was just gonna start with this one from Greg Lopez uh, at Murdoch Uni. Um, how is extremism defined in Malaysia and what constitutes hate speech, lies, slander, and fair comment? Um, I think this is really addressed to a lawmaker like you, Shalina. Is there legislation to define this and are the courts, the police, the new home minister sufficiently independent to address this in a just manner? So I'll, I'll try my best uh, to answer this. Um, yes, currently right now, um, I, I guess the best is you define extremism by, by putting forth ideals that, that go against, you know, universal values and things that, that just go against, you know, basic human rights. But basically, we do have laws, um, and it's actually quite fitting and timely that this question came about because just recently there was um, a whole discussion where the new Home Minister has said in a statement that you know he feels it's not the right time to to um, to repeal the uh, SOSMA. And what was it? Just yesterday, on my way to to Parliament, there was um, that. There was a gathering um, of, of, of a protest of some sort. Um, but here's here's again one of the, the challenges of the current government, which is you know, we do have a lot of reforms that need to be done. And um, it's this is where the, the real challenges challenges lie. Um, as much as we want to push for the reforms, it's it goes back to questioning is, you know, is it the right time right now? Because we do have uh, state elections coming soon. And we're also dealing with an opposition that's just really, really hell bent on using extremism. Um, but pushing forward, um, you know, we do have to also look into how such things are being executed, how such things are being enforced. And it boils down to also empowering, you know, the, 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 the other um, police officers on how to handle these these cases. For example, when we talk about uh, Sedition Act. You know, it's we all know it's a, it's a law that 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 prevents content that's deemed as seditious. But then, what exactly is seditious? Because we also have uh, within the Constitution a Malaysian social contract that that also protects the rights of certain groups. So there's a lot of again fact finding that people need to to do and this is one of the the main responsibilities or rather the main things that the the current government and the present lawmakers would have to sit down and really really work towards 
And um, I was just wondering, Shaza, whether you might have a view on this. I mean, are such laws actually going to be effective in addressing those concerns you've raised as well about the way the politics is played? You meaning the current law or what we want something to happen? Current law, I think, not enough. Um, it's definitely not enough. I mean, I let Shalina mention, obviously, the Sedition Act, right? <laughs> one thing that I always don't like about it is one of the things that uh, is the problem is supposedly if you annoy something, right? The word annoyance is there, uh, which I find very problematic because it's, it's subjective, right? It's up to a person's interpretation, thus it can easily be politicized, which obviously it has been politicized. Um, so it doesn't deal with the problem of extremism in Malaysia because as we've been talking about, um, the political environment in Malaysia right now is it's always been problematic, but now it's become more so with identity politics, specifically, of course, I'm talking about the uh, extreme views of certain Malay Muslims. And thus, I feel no one really wants to touch that as an issue. If I may say, I feel like the problems that we're facing in the country today, um, in terms of the economy issue, and you mentioned, Ken, about the, the, the floodings, it's kind of like a blessing in disguise for the government, even though I don't like to say it that way, because it pushes uh, these reforms on, on um, regarding hate speech further. Uh, it's not our immediate concern. Um, so they don't have to deal with it, and it's not easy to deal with it, as uh, all of you have pointed out. Um, and that's the thing. Um, first of all, Malaysia is not politically mature, like uh, the speakers have mentioned, uh, about respecting the rights of each other. And when we talk about hate speech, right, people don't understand the difference between hate speech and dangerous speech. Of course, in the name of, of um, freedom of expression, you can disagree with anyone that, as you like. No one's going to stop you, right? You don't agree with me? Fine. But when it comes to dangerous speech, we don't make that distinction yet. Hate speech is one thing, but when you go down the road of actually inciting hate to a point that people could take, not take arms necessarily, but you know, they, uh, put society in danger, there should be uh, some law for that. But at the moment, we don't have it. So <laughs> that's why I was asking, is it uh, law that we have now or later? Uh, something with that we should work towards, but I don't see it uh, soon. Thanks, Shaza. Uh, we've got a few more questions here. Uh, one's addressed to James, but I think uh, all of you can answer it too, and also to Shalina. Um, it's about the old faces still dominating Malaysian politics. Has G15, the 15th general election, offered any prospect of um, a renewal, given that there's actually a whole bunch of much younger MPs coming to office, uh, not just Shalina, of course, but also many in the opposition, uh, passes wave, which now makes the biggest bulk of uh, opposition MPs. There are many um, young MPs there as well. Um, what what prospects for that, and whether um, you know this risk of perhaps ongoing uh, political instability because of the way the coalition has been put together, which includes Amno. I mean, will this hold together uh, uh, and not have a repeat of? so many prime ministers in so many years going forward, given the uncertain economic times as well. Um, is something for both James, Shalina, and also Shaza, if you want to answer it. So I'll start first. Um, so I think this government is will be stable at least until the state elections next year. I don't think there's a, there, there, there is a problem. If you look at the uh, voting numbers for the speaker, it's quite, quite clear that in the initial stage, they do have exactly 148. Uh, so I think that will be stable. Uh, so two things can trigger instability. One is the uh, election results of the state elections next year. Secondly, is that if we get a verdict in the Zahid trial, uh, depends on which way the verdict goes, I think that will lead to uh, whether it is stable or in, uh, unstable. The good mm -hmm. thing about the anti-hopping law now is that uh, if there's going to be any 
defection, it will be based on the entire block, the entire party will, will defect rather than individuals. So Sheraton move, if there's going to be one, will look very different uh, going forward. Now, in terms of the young people in Parliament, it is true that uh, there was quite a number of uh, uh, so-called young people, but they're really not that young. Eh? But anyway, <laughs> they're younger than the, than, the, than the old group. But the problem is, uh, is that the way Malaysian politics is structured is still a very top-down design approach. So uh, unless the older groups are willing to seek more political space, more political responsibility to the younger group, uh, nothing much will change. So uh, the way leadership, political leadership, especially on the government side, uh, the way it was is still very much a, 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 a top-down uh, uh, system. So it is not the number of younger people, it's whether how much space the people with power, the older group, wants to give way or give more responsible uh, to, the, to the younger MPs. Shalina, do you have a view on this? Yeah, uh, just just a few things. Like, first of all, I do believe that political maturity, you know, it it takes time, and uh, you know, in, in in that sense, Malaysia is still very young. I mean, let's not forget that you know, prior to two thousand eighteen, Malaysia had only experienced one government, one one system, for over six de six decades, and then we finally changed that. And then there was a lot of chaos that happened in between. And then now we're in a situation where we have a unity government. So I want to be optimistic about where we're heading as a nation. You know, we will get there, but you know, let's be cautious. Let's be aware that before we get to that level of political maturity that we, we envision, there will be a lot of um, interesting challenges that we would have to try to overcome. But regardless of what happens, you know, for, for us in the Karaja and Prapaduan, the three main areas we should always focus on would be, you know, the economy, healthcare, and education. And that, you know, just trying to find ways to help the country, that should always be the main focus right now, I mean, irrespective of, you know, ideologies and whatnot. And as what, you know, what I, I, I see, us happening right now post GE 15 is whatever it is, you know, our goal right now is to keep Malaysia moderate, I guess, you know, just keep it, keep it functioning and keep it logical and keep, you know, extremism out in the system. Mm. And do you think that structurally it's um, possible in terms of trying to implement, I don't know, effective types of policies within the parties or, you know, enable or bring forward uh, more parliamentary select committees uh, to engage so many MPs, uh, new MPs, in fact. Um, something that, I, I, I don't know, I think Shaza uh, and I had, you know, briefly, you know, mentioned or discussed as well, right? What type of structural reforms are possible? Definitely pushing for parliamentary reforms, seeing more, you know, select committees, uh, that would be definitely a way forward. But, you know, having having this government, it's kind of like, um, you know, it's a big family. I mean, sometimes you don't get along with certain family members, but you still have to sit down and discuss to find out ways and how everybody can get along. And that I do see happening right now. And this is where Anwar, you know, has such a mammoth task ahead you know he's you know he's waited for a very long time and i do have faith that he will do what's best for the country you know it's it's definitely challenging it is i can't lie so but in the meantime as james points out we have about what uh six months before the first lot of state elections so there's actually not a lot of time is there shaza for instance to try and uh, tackle some of this uh, mindset change or narrative change you suggested? I totally agree with you. I don't think we have enough time. I mean, uh, James mentioned that uh, the government needs to win at least four out of, out of six. And when I heard that, I'm like, Ugh, I somehow don't see that happening. Um, I'm maybe too pessimistic, but Four out of six states uh, that's that's coming up. That's that's a very mammoth task for the Pakatan Harapan government. 
even working together with Barisan National, um, it might not be enough because, like we've discussed, Barisan National is, is tainted. Um, so they're not much help in a way. Uh, so six months is really not enough because what we're looking for is really a long-term change. Like Sharina mentioned that we're looking for a more mature Malaysia in terms of as a nation, politically, and these things obviously don't happen overnight and I don't think it, it's going to happen within six months. Um, though I, I don't want it to happen, but I foresee this green ripple will reach these six states um, and thus would make uh, governing much more difficult, like James said, much more difficult for Anwar and his government. But if they can, if, right, a big if, if they can uh, hold on to this, this uh, project and perpaduan, this is the long-term aim anyway, to change people's mindset uh, economically, as, as has been mentioned a few times. But also, uh, I think uh, for me, my emphasis is that Anwar must play his role as a leading Muslim political figure, right? And to, to show to Malaysians and to the world that what it, it meant to be a Muslim leader, right? That, that focuses on a more holistic manner as opposed to just this rhetoric of, of us against them, Muslims against non-Muslims. So it's, it's, a, it's a long way to go, but uh, maybe steps. And maybe as you suggest, um, with these floods and these uh, difficult economic conditions, if the government manages to uh, deliver some progress there and to tackle the floods successfully, it could actually improve Malaysians' uh, faith in good government. And maybe that would be in the new government's favour. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully that's that's what we're hoping for, we're praying for, right? But again, maybe I'm just too pessimistic. But looking at the ground among the Malay Muslims, it has come to a point that it doesn't matter. They just have decades of frustration. Uh, that even when you show them good governance, it, it for them they will just say, ah, that's what governments do, right? Um, so they're asking for more than good governance, which is in a way quite ridiculous because what government does is, is governing, but yeah, they're asking more for a kind of a guarantee of a, of, a, of a good life for a Muslim in their, in their view, what that means. So we're hoping that the government could show uh, that they are able, they're capable to solve the people's issues, but Again, at the moment, at this point, there's just too much uh, pushback from, from uh, some Malay Muslims. Thanks, Shaza. Um, the two other questions here uh, to be answered, and they aren't very long, but one is addressed actually to James, uh, to a previous uh, comment you made, that whether this comparison to Singapore uh, is justified given the dramatic difference in the racial demographics? So I, I, I did mention that in my previous comment that in Singapore is Chinese majority, but what I'm talking about is that the process Singapore went through to create a Singapore identity. And I'm saying that Singapore as a country was also divided by race and religion, and they did manage to cobble together a Singapore identity uh, quite fast after 65. And I was just giving an example because a lot of people in Malaysia said that you cannot have a common identity because you know the Malaysian races are so divided that there's no there's no common ground. And what I what I'm suggesting is that uh, that the experience of Malaysia is not unique. There are other countries also segmented by race and religion, and they did come together and create a country's identity. So that that was what I would say in context to Singapore. It wasn't about the the the, the demographics there, and I did mention previously that uh, Singapore is different than Malaysia because it's Chinese majority. Thanks, James. Um, we, we now have um, an interesting, I think, uh, foreign policy question, which is addressed to Shaza, but I was hoping maybe we could expand it a little bit. Initial, uh, the question actually is about how um, 
Shaza, whether you think that past, which is now the biggest opposition bloc, whether they have any uh, main foreign policy goals, uh, differences compared to Anwar's new government, and whether it might, these past MPs might, you know, use their power to influence Malaysia's engagement with its region and the rest of the world. But I suppose in the broader foreign policy space as well, whether Anwar Ibrahim, who is of course very well known around the world and in the region after his decades of struggle, uh, whether this new government actually would make much of a difference or have any changes in position given the heightened you know, geostrategic tensions that now afflict um, Southeast Asia. And that would be a question also for you, Shalina and James. Do I, do I go first? Sure, Shaza, um, please. <laughs> sure. All right. Uh, so I'll leave the, the second part maybe to James or Sharina. Uh, but the question on, on past foreign policy, um, maybe I'll, I'll start by actually speaking of, of Anwar first. Uh, we're talking about him anyway, right, today. Um, see, the thing about, about Anwar, like you've, you've, uh, you've mentioned, Karen, that he has been in this struggle for, for, for a long time, right? For two decades, very well known. And in a way that he is respected by most world leaders um, from the most conservative to the most liberal. So why am I mentioning this is because um, some would point to uh, Anwar's close relation to certain Muslim leaders, for example, President Erdogan of Turkey, and even he's quite close to Imran Khan of, of Pakistan. Um, and unfortunately, like these two uh, figures, um, well, people question their leadership style, right? Uh, and unfortunately as well, it has been conflated with Islam. Um, so people question if, if Anwar is, is within the same, I guess, hate space and, and leadership style as them, which is, uh, a kind of populist uh, leadership with uh, Islamism at the back. But for me, it's not necessarily. I think, like I said earlier, Anwar is just someone that commands respect from most leaders, including and especially, especially in the Muslim world. Um, but it doesn't reflect his leadership style, I think and I hope. Um, so that's on Anwar's government. Going to pass, <laughs> I don't see them having a, a a a real foreign policy agenda except uh, support for certain groups of people that align with them um, ideologically. I know a lot of people like to point to um, pass a support for the Taliban, immediate support for the Taliban take over last year um, as proof of where a past government would would lead to. But I think more worrying than that is they don't really have a, a proper foreign policy agenda. So that's not good for Malaysia um, if they ever come to power. And I'll let James and Shalina continue on the other part. Oh, okay, so uh, thank you for the question. So I think in terms of Anwar Ibrahim, I agree with uh, what the previous speaker said. He is very well known internationally, uh, but I think his influence will be limited now, not because of, of, of who he is. I'm sure if he were to pick up the phone to any world leaders, uh, they will be happy to talk to him. So he will have access. I think in general, I think a lot of uh, so-called Western countries were very happy that it was Anwar Ibrahim who became the prime minister because they were a bit worried that if the other side has gotten in, uh, things will be much more difficult. Uh, but my point now is that now is the wrong time for Anwar Ibrahim uh, to, to, you know, to have a major foreign policy forays because I think he's got to fight the battle at home first, the domestic issue he really has to resolve. But more importantly, uh, it's the wrong timing because uh, the world today uh, in terms of uh, the international arena is really consumed by the Ukraine crisis. So even if he wants to do something, I doubt very much there's space in the international arena for him to do something. So um, my personal preference is for him to, to deal with Malaysian issues first, 
and deal with the international issues later, but leveraging on this international context to help Malaysia. Thanks, James. And I think um, we might try and uh, finish a couple of last minutes and last um, points, but Shalina, I didn't want to cut you off because I think uh, you being in the government perhaps might be able to offer what you would propose they could do and they might listen to you more than any of us. <laughs> oh, I disagree. Um, I'll, I'll just I'll just say by um, I do agree with um, you know both uh, both speakers about about what's going on. Um, I do agree that PAS doesn't seem to have any clear vision, any policies other than using race and religion. But you know that's very short term. Um, and to govern a country, uh, you need to definitely have something more more cohesive, something with more substantial content. Um, but coming to Anwar, um, you know, Anwar has had experience in the cabinet prior to 1998. And, um, you know, he's actually had experience holding several portfolios. So he does have experience. And this is about him coming back in to the government and steering this country through through uncharted waters. Um, but already you've seen the changes that he's done. Uh, for example, he has already cut down the number of ministers and deputy ministers. That's one. And, um, but yeah, right now the focus is internally. It's, it's, sorry, the focus should be domestic. Foreign policies would be probably after PRN, the state elections because we might have six months or we might have less. So it's it's a race against time. And also in February, that's when the, the budget will be, will be uh, tabled. So most of the, the concentration would definitely be domestically, what can Malaysia experience? So really a lot of uncertainty, even in this coming quarter and watch this space. Um, any final words from you, Shaza? And James? So my final word is, I think uh, there is a lot of goodwill towards Anwar Ibrahim. And I think there's a lot of goodwill over this government as well. Uh, but I think uh, a lot of people, especially the chartering class in Malaysia, a lot of them are actually uh, holding back. Uh, part of it is because, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's because of state elections next year. And also, I think, uh, as the, uh, my friend Shazza has mentioned, uh, they are not sure about whether the green wave is a permanent realignment or it is a temporary thing. So because of that, a lot of people are, are holding off. I think the final point I want to make is that I think it's really, really important for the Pakatan government 2.0 this time. They have to work together because one of the reasons they fell apart in Pakatan Harapan 1.0 was because uh, every group or every political party, every minister in the last government did their own thing. Secondly, I think they really need to get a grip on the civil service because I remember clearly in Pakatan uh, Harapan 1.0, especially in the first year, the only person who had a grip on the civil service was the old man. Uh, a lot of the ministers had problems with the civil service. So now they've given another chance. I think it's very uh, clear that they have to work together collectively as a group. And secondly, they really need to work the civil service. Uh, and I think th those are the sort of uh, important things that I, I forgot to mention earlier. Thank you. Thanks, James. And uh, Shaza, you have the last word. What do you think? What are the prospects? What are the prospects? So many uncertainties. I may not want to go there, but if I may, I just want to add to what uh, James said. I agree those are the two things that they need to focus on right now, but I just want to add one more thing. Communication, right? That's also uh, one area which they failed previously, 2018-2022, and it seems like they are falling short as well this time around in terms of communicating to the public, the direction um, of the government, and more than that, the, the narrative um, for the nation, as we've been discussing uh, for the past uh, one hour, what, what is Malaysia is about, and they should set that narrative, which I'm not seeing right now. So if you can do these three things, uh, maybe we would have uh, a good quarter next year. Great. Thank you so much, all of you, um, Shalina, Shaza, James, for participating, and also 
all of you who've been uh, tuning in and uh, sending various questions. Thanks very much. I hope we managed to get everyone's uh, answers um, successfully um, dealt with. And thanks very much to the Asia Link team uh, in Melbourne and in Bangkok, um, Sally, Don, Fadil, uh, to helping us facilitate all of this. It's been very good. Thanks very much. And uh, yeah, greetings for the season uh, and the year end rush for the exits of 2022. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, manage to continue this discussion in the new year. Bye for now. Thanks very much.